Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you're well fed and watered after lunch and ready for a bit of, uh, hopefully a little bit of controversy. Um, can I have the first slide, please? Uh, what we're going to do uh, today is talk a little bit about some cases uh, around uh, revision uh, sinus surgery. Uh, we'll cover a, cover a number of different um, pathologies uh, and we are, uh, we're going to uh, start really at some of the more basic um, uh, problems and then uh, move up into uh, some more complicated things. So we hope to make it uh, relevant for, uh, for all members of the, uh, the audience. I'd, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, our um, panel. Uh, we've got uh, Ian Whitrick from uh, Canada, uh, Richard Vogels from Brazil, Paul White from Scotland, Joe Rimmer from Australia. We've got Christos Jorglas, sorry, I can see my spectacles on, from uh, Greece, uh, Cordo Sorofano from uh, uh, Romania, and Kornagat uh, Snidbogs from Thailand. So we've got a, a multinational uh, panel which should uh, help us in terms of our uh, cases, and uh, we will kick off. Uh, with this one here. So this is a, a patient. He's a 30-year-old um, male. He's had some sinus surgery uh, in the past. He tells us we don't know what he's uh, what he's had. About 10 years ago or so, he's been absolutely fine for eight years following his surgery. No symptoms uh, really what, whatsoever. He's used a, a nasal spray from time to time, um, but he's come back in and his, uh, to see, and his only problem really is a, a blocked nose and a, and, a, and a bit of reduction in his sense of smell. But it's, it's only when you sort of push him that he, uh, he says that. So I suppose the question really is, um, how are you going to take this forward, Ian? What's your, your sort of thoughts on, on this? All right. Uh, so uh, generally we'd say uh, what sort of topical therapies has he been using? Is he using them effectively? And if that's not working, then I go to systemic steroids, uh, get a CT scan with a view to revision sinus surgery if he doesn't respond to the uh, medical management. Okay. I don't see any purulence, so I'm not that keen on uh, antibiotics or something like that. Okay, so let's just say that uh, you organize a, uh, a CT scan and there's, really, there's not very much on that scan at all. He's got uh, a little bit of mucosal thickening uh, within his sinuses, but essentially he's got a London Mackay less than, less than 10, but he's got a, he's got a nose full of, uh, of polyps. What are you, you going to offer him then? And he's, he's tried medical therapy. He's had, he's had some steroids. He's had, he's had a bit of nasal spray. Then I'd offer sinus surgery to remove the polyps, open the sinuses. Okay, yeah. Would, uh, would anybody else do anything different? Well, um, well th uh, first I'd like to thank uh, for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here today. And, um, well, I do the same. I do nasal lavage with st systemic steroids. And surgery is, depends on the clinical symptoms of the patient. If the clinical symptoms are not that you know, that's strong. If the patient is getting well with just a polyp, I, I wait a little bit for surgery. But if the symptoms are more intense, then I talk with the patient and then maybe we go. So symptoms surgery. really are only a blocked nose and a bit of a reduction in sense of smell, a bit of snoring at night. His wife's beginning to nudge him because he's getting a bit noisy. Mm -hmm. Anybody do anything different? Yes, I'd like to know if there are some underlying causes for this rhinosinusitis. Well, he doesn't have much in the way of rhinosinusitis. And also a, a culture from his nose. Yeah, okay, so he's, there's nothing grows on culture because he's got no, there's no mucoperulence here. He's just got some, he's just got some polyps. Then allergy tests? Yeah, maybe. no allergies. Maybe. No. What about his IgE? IgE's, full count? IgE is normal. And no allergy to aspirin, no asthma? No. Nope. Right. Yeah. Okay. So are you going to, the question really is, are you going, to, uh, you going to open up all his sinuses or are you just going to take his polyps out? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, he, you've said he's got a very low Lund Mackay score and yep. he's got polyps in his nose. Yeah. And he's got no aspirin hypersensitivity and his IgE is normal. So the progno prognosis for him is very good. Yeah. If you treat it properly, you're telling us he's... You've put him on systemic steroids for a long period and he hasn't improved. He's not really, he's not really any better from the steroids. He's so you should operate on him. Yeah. Take what? the polyps out and, and uh, do a limited ethmoidectomy as well. Okay. You want to 
to reduce the volume of disease. Would anybody do more or less than a limited ethmoidectomy? Would anybody just take his polyps out and leave it at that? No? Okay. Would anybody go any further than that? Yeah. You, you want to do and uh, trace the disease. Get the disease out. You know, you don't, if, you're not going to, if you're going to take the polyps and you've still got some ethmoid disease. Yeah. So you said a limited ethmoidectomy. Is anybody going to do more than a limited ethmoidectomy? But only because you said the CT was a, a low lung. Yeah, line. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Just wondering if anybody else has got any different... Well, I, I think if he's got, although it's low-level disease, I think if he's got disease sort of throughout his ethmoids, then you take the polyps out, antrostomy, open up anterior and probably posterior ethmoids as well. If there's no disease in his sphenoids, you could leave them yep. alone. If there's disease in his sphenoids, you could do a sphenoethmoidectomy because you're just going to give him a bigger cavity that he can douche and get topical steroids into more easily to mm. go with that good yeah. prognosis that he's probably already got anyway. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think where you're probably driving with this is are we going to do sort of some, some people are advocating maximal openings yep. of sinuses, including low thrust and whatnot, as the first operation, which I don't believe in. And so I think what my colleagues have said about uh, opening of the ethmoid, maxillary, and other sinuses, depending on the CT, is all that's warranted for something like this. Okay. May I ask something? Maybe I didn't understand. You said you had a, say, um, he has a low uh, Latma K score, but, okay. but that means that could mean, for example, he has a four, he has anterior posterior ethmoids, right? Opacified completely. He's got what, a little what? bit of a pacification in his anterior, ethmoid. very minimal in his posterior, next to nothing in his maxilla next to nothing in his sphenoid. Mm. Okay, I mean, in, in that case, uh, again, in a way, it's, there are also technical issues, like uh, antrostomy, I always do a medial, medial antrostomy in any case when I do endoscopic sinus surgery, also for a purpose of, of guiding your uh, surgical steps. Then um, opening of the ethmoids, again, is something that I would definitely do, not only in terms of uh, taking out the disease, but in terms of creating, as Joe said, a cavity that would be easier to rinse and easier to... I think that there has been a lot of, um, or significant anyway, amount of evidence over the last few years that um, the extent of surgery does correlate with better outcomes. And I think there was something personal, like I'm telling you from my experience, that I used to be much more I, I was taught that I was uh, raised to be much more uh, conservative in this type of surgery. Uh, when I started 2002, 2003, did my first phases, just take the polyps out, do the antrostomy, it's a medical disease, it will be cured by medicine. And then gradually, uh, it's something that uh, my, my personal philosophy has changed. And I think it mirrored this change that has happened in many of my colleagues, that people tend to be more radical. And it, it doesn't add a lot in terms of surgical time, I think. It doesn't make a big difference. It doesn't yeah. add in terms of morbidity. So I would consider more. But radical, are you talking low throp and no, no, no. maxillectomy? No, no, no. When I say more radical, it's a good point. Right. I'm not talking about destructive drilling out of maxilla or, right. or draft three. But a complete ethmoid. But a complete, what do they say, a full house, fair. it's a good, I like right. this, a full house fair. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Australian term, I think. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's just move on and imagine actually that the history is a little bit different. So we've got the same endoscopic appearance. We've got a, uh, a fellow who is a um, similar sort of age uh, and he is an aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, uh, poor sense of smell, lots of mucus, uh, difficulty sleeping at night. Um, and again, he uh, has got a scan that looks a little bit more like this. So he's got a, uh, a, a, a pan sinusitis. Let's imagine he's got big frontal sinuses and uh, his uh, frontal sinuses are full of, uh, uh, are, are pacified as well, fully pacified. Uh, he gets a bit of discomfort uh, across his forehead. He gets pretty s severe headaches when he gets a respiratory infection. Uh, he's had, an endos or he's had a, some sort of endoscopic procedure done previously. Uh, and the question is, would you manage him any differently from the person who just had, a s had simple polyps and not much in the way of sinus disease? So if we just go from the other end now, Cornicat, what would you... Yeah, much different, because uh, surgery do not cure the disease. Uh, in this case, the patient has AERD. Um, so we must plan for the long-term control of the disease, uh, which is eosinophilic inflammation. So I would provide the access for the long-term topical management, including uh, saline irrigation, 
perhaps uh, with steroid irrigation. But um, when patients say um, they have uh, aspirin sensitivities, I think we should confirm by the, the test. So um, the, uh, the food is essential that uh, we need to suggest the salicylate-free diet for this patient. Is that something that everybody would consider doing? Does everybody test for salicylates in this, in this sort of setting? I, yeah. I don't routinely test for it, but if they've got a history of aspirin exacerbated disease, then I would give them a sort of low salicylate diet advice. How strictly they follow it is sort of up to them. But yeah. Would you like to follow that sort of diet? In no, our, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In our okay. country, they are testing, but they are not performing the desensitization. You know, yeah. that's a problem with these patients with uh, aspirin exacerbating respiratory disease. So we know that they have this allergy, this intolerance, but yeah. they are not treated with this type of... By my point of view, in this case, uh, there are some remnants from the ancinate and some remnants also in the ethmoids. I will clear everything just to be sure that we have a very good operation and to assure that we can provide also the rinsing and the uh, corticosteroids to reach the, these cavities. What would you do about the frontal sinuses? About the frontal sinuses, it depends. You said something, I do not have the images. Uh, as we heard in the morning, much more aggressive operations are indica indicated, but it, depending on these CT scans, I think that a draft tool, it could be sufficient. I'm not sure, because I do not have the... So let, let's a well pneumatized frontal recess lots of polyps or lots of muco certainly mucosal disease in the uh, frontal sinuses. A and also a draft sinus. trick uh, could yeah. uh, so be the, discussed. So he's had, he's had endoscopic sinus surgery previously, but, but it, what appears to be minimal surgery. Uh, are you going to go and do a Lothrop as your first maneuver? In my hands, yes. Okay. What about the rest of the panel? Do you mean Anybody for primary surgery? Different? For, for primary surgery, right? Yeah. Actually, I, I do a lot of for Salva's surgeries. I, I do not do for primary yeah. surgery. I don't, I don't do primary Lathrop routinely. But he has been operated before. He's, He's been operated about, yeah. about 10 years ago, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think you have a discussion with the patient. You know, it, sh it should, should be patient-led. And included in that discussion is a revisit of the diagnosis and the surgical options, which would include, you know, it's not primary, uh, as a secondary procedure, a low throat, you'd, you'd have to consider. But you know, uh, give the patient the information and, and let them decide, I think. So you, you give the patient the information and he says, listen, Doc, I don't really understand. Um, you tell me what to do. <laughs> oh, I would go for a, probably for, for a case like this, I'd be more inclined to go for a low throat procedure second time round. You know, and the, the same strategy as full house face. Mm. Um, in my experience over the years, these cases, they, the, the polyps come back, and yeah. the, the first place they recur is in the frontal recess. Mm -hmm. And the, the patients with aspirin hypersensitivity who have had the low throat procedure and a full house face yeah. tend to do better. Yeah. Tend to. Ian? Yeah, I, I wouldn't typically go with a low throat at this point. I'd be doing more of a, a draft two sort of procedure to, to open it because. Even when I do draft threes on these patients, the polyps recur and then you're treating them. And it depends, it's the symptoms. If it's frontal headaches, the severe symptoms, then sure. But if it's just blocked nose, then to me that's different. And the other thing that I don't think we've touched upon is ASA desensitization. Because yeah. I mean, there's yeah. very good evidence that doing sort of a maximal surgical, or as maximal as what you think is maximal, and then post-operative uh, ASA desensitization. Yeah. The problem that we have is that not all allergists are very comfortable with it, and there's a whole host of issues of GI sensitivity and what to do when they need another operation for something else and coming off of it and having to restart again, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of issues, but it, it certainly does work probably in at least three quarters of these uh, patients okay. to improve longevity. So let's say we've, we, uh, we do a full house phase, we do a low throp. Um, how are you going to manage him post-operatively? What sort of meds are you going to give him? Well, um, this, is a, this is very different from the first patient. This is a patient that 
it's like a chronic disease. We will have to see this patient probably for many, many years. I think this is important. The patient uh, has this knowledge and, and he is willing to, to be with us for all this time. And what's important during surgery, in my opinion, is to keep the sinus open. And it might be in this case, it's necessary to do uh, a luthrop. Depends, for me, it depends on, on what was done on the first surgery. Mm -hmm. And um, the pause op operative is what you ask. It has to be, in my, in my experience, it has to be very intense. We keep the nasal lavage for a long time and many times a day with uh, topical steroids. And I see these patients quite often to see if there is any recurrence uh, in those cases to act more um, uh, soon to prevent the polyps to come back, or to try to prevent them. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's move on from that and uh, look at this, uh, this case. So here we've got a, uh, a patient uh, who's um, come in. Uh, he's got a blocked nose, he's got a blocked nose on both sides actually. Um, and uh, this has been coming on gradually. Uh, he hasn't really got any other symptoms. Again, it's interfering with his sleep. He remembers having an operation about four or five years ago doesn't really know what the details were, but he had a blocked nose at that point, and uh, he got better from it. Um, and uh, when you have a look in the left-hand side, that's what you see in the, uh, in the back of the nose. And when you have a little look on the uh, right-hand side, uh, that's what you see. Uh, and uh, what do you think you're looking at there, Christos? It's difficult to tell. I mean, there, there is obviously a mass in the postnasal space. Uh, and he had an operation. I mean, I, I would want to, ha to know what operation he had, if there is a histology. Well, he, was was to he was told he had a polyp removed, but he wasn't, very, he wasn't given any more information than that. I would, um, I would like to do some imaging and then do a biopsy of uh, what this is. Okay, so you, uh, you arrange some uh, imaging. You do a CT. Uh, antrochoanal, yeah. Antrochoanal polyp. Yeah. yeah, so he comes back. He's had, a, he's had a, an antrochoanal polyp removed previously, but uh, it doesn't look like he's had too much of uh, the coena, uh, sorry, the antro part. He's had the coena part dealt with. How are you going to counsel him? What are you going to suggest? I, I would like in this case to do, um, most of the case of the recurrence of antrochoanal polyps have to do with taking out the, the root where they're attached. And from the ones that I had to do is usually an issue of, uh, in my hands, to get a good enough access at their base, I would need to um, do at least a partial medial maxillectomy. Not necessarily a type three, not necessarily taking out the nasolacrimal duct, but one that I would like to see the axial, actually. The axial scans would help me as to see to uh, where they're attached. But I would like to do a, a medial maxillectomy and then make sure that I remove and drill out the attachment of the uh, androcoinal polyp. Okay, so just tell us a bit more about that medial maxillectomy. How much are you going to take away of that medial wall? Um, to be honest, again, for antrochoanal polyp, as opposed to um, uh, inverted papilloma, for example, that's attached anteriorly or anterolaterally, uh, I would try to preserve the nasolacrimal duct. And in the, uh, the last year, I have started doing more and more of uh, a prelacrimal approach of uh, in other words, making an incision on the uh, bone, on the uh, anterior medial wall of the maxilla, just anterior to the nasolacrimal duct, and then medializing it, getting access, because you don't need to remove the medial maxillary wall is not involved. You just want to remove it to get access. Okay. So just medialize the nasolacrimal duct, get access, and drill out the posterior wall of the floor of the maxillary sinus, where the attachment is coming from, and then reattach and bring back the uh, lacrimal duct and the medial and the, maxillary wall. And the inferior turbinate? You leave that alone, or do you take that out as well? Uh, it would depend. It's something that endoscopically you should be able to see whether if it's uh, uh, infiltrating, if it's part of the inferior turbinate, or if it's distinct. I mean, I, I don't think I can see it very clearly. So when you, from, when you, when you debride if it? If it takes part, I would take it out. So you, you would think about taking out the inferior yeah, turbinate as well? Yeah, okay. if it's infiltrating, if it's part. So that's a, that's a fairly big procedure. Um, would anybody do anything a little less than that? I wouldn't take out the inferior turbinate. If it's yep. not inverting papilloma and it's just an uh, antrochoanal polyp, yep. you can detach the inferior turbinate on its artery. So it's just like doing a, the old-fashioned inferior turbinectomy, but leaving the inferior turbinate artery attached, and then you push it back into the nasopharynx, 
and that gives you the ability to do a, a, a turbinate preserving medial maxillectomy. Don't so worry about the nasal lacrimal duct too, too much. So you, can, you take the turbinate off, yep. and, and then what do you do with the, 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 the uh, adjacent medial wall of the maxilla? Do you take that out? Well, if it's a, a um, I, I assume you're talking about a very difficult and, um, anticoanal polyp where you're trying to find the root I'm of it. I'm just wondering what you would do for a sort of, yes, it's not difficult. Well, I would, a, I would have one. no hesitation about taking out lateral walls. The important thing is you want to try and preserve empty nose syndrome. Yeah. And what causes empty nose syndrome is loss of the inferior turbinate. You don't need to lose it unless it's yeah. involved with a mm. neoplastic process. Okay. You detach it, put it so, in the nasopharynx, yeah. then bring it forward, and then re reattach it. Okay, with, so we've got, we've got two, two options there so far. We've got a, a, a medial maxillectomy in, in all but name. We've got a, a partial medial maxillectomy with preservation of the turbinate. Would anybody do anything different? Well, I think the amount of... Uh, the the extent of the medial maxillectomy depends on where it's attached. You yep. take out, as you said, how much would you take down? You take yep. it down as much as you need to to, get, yeah. to do the proper operation and, and get the whole thing but, out. But and that depends where it's attached. Where, where, the, where do you tend to find they're usually attached where, in your sort of experience? They're usually sort of floor and uh, in the more, less, much less commonly anteriorly. Yeah. So they're usually floor yeah. in the more posterior part of the sinus. So mm. I don't think you often need to come that, that far anteriorly with antrocranial polyps. Okay. Ian, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, well, for these things, they come out through the posterior ostia, and so you make a wide antrostomy, and then sometimes you can get the cystic part, because the part in the maxillary sinus is usually not a polyp, it's usually a mucus retention cyst. cyst. Uh, so sometimes you can get the whole thing out just endoscopically uh, with that, and then I use a 70-degree scope and look in, if there's still remnants in, I do a canine puncture and put the shaver in through the canine fossa, and using a 70-degree scope, you can remove all of the remnant uh, without anything too fancy. That's well, another good way to do it, but it doesn't address the anterior wall. Is the problem? Uh, well, if, if you've if got there's some, anything, if there's if something got, there, then if you've you got can, something arising from the anterior wall. You're not you're not going to get it that way. Yeah, I've never seen one on the anterior wall. They're usually based inferiorally or laterally. Yeah. May I just, like, uh, um, excuse, excuse me, please. Just one thing, just to confirm what I said, the pre-lacrimal approach, just to describe maybe some people in the audience are not. Uh, it essentially it means that the medial wall is medialized, including the inferior turbinate and the old area, and then it's. Uh, stitched back together until so eventually at the end of the prelacmal approach the inferior turbinate and most of the medial maxillary wall is still there so the prelacmal approach doesn't include removing the inferior turbinate it involves reattaching it and stitching it back okay uh, there are two things i want to stress first of all uh, it should not be an aggressive surgery if it's an antroquinal polyp yeah. sometimes the antroquinal polyp is going to the nose through another uh, let's say ostium, and we have to take care to connect the two holes, the natural ostium and the posterior part ostium that was made by the polyp, and then we'll gain a very big antrostomy. In, th in this case, we can enter in the sinus and explore the sinus. Otherwise, I completely agree with you that we can look in my hands through the um, uh, inferior meatus, going there by sinusoscopy with an endoscope 70 degrees and looking about maybe some, about some remnants, and that's okay. all. So not an extensive surgery, this is the idea. Pornicat, any, uh, any place for cold will look? Uh, no, I do not do cold will look for this. Uh, I agree with the panelists that uh, it should not be an aggressive surgery. It's just the access to search for the origin of the antrochronal polyp. Okay, that's fine. Uh, have the audience got any questions about this case? So the question you're asking is, would you remove all the mucosa yeah, yeah. from I'd the mucosa? Yeah, I'd mucosa in the uh, sinus or not. Mm. Kornikad, do you want to answer that? Would you remove all the maxillary uh, mucosa? Uh, repeat the question again. Sorry. Would you remove all the maxillary sinus mucosa? Ah, uh, no, no, I will not. I will preserve the maxillary sinus mucosa. Just remove the origin of the antrochronal polyp and the whole polyp. 
That was the question, uh, what extent of the mucosa will you remove? What extent of the mucosa of yeah. the sinus will be removed? Yeah. I will preserve the normal mucosa of the sinus, the, the whole sinus mucosa. Not at all. Just the polyp. So he's going to remove the polyp and the, and the base of the polyp? Yeah, and the base of the polyp. Okay. Anybody any different from that? Just need a, a nod of the head or a shake of the... Shake of the head. No, okay, so we'll move on to the, um, to the next case. Thank you for that. That uh, obviously uh, created a bit of difference, which we, uh, we like. Um, now, here's a, a, a patient uh, who basically presents with um, a dysosmia. It's a 40-year-old fella. He's had a bad smell in his nose for some uh, months now. He, when he blows his nose, he gets thick mucus out of that side of his nose. Um, and uh, he gets a bit of discomfort in his maxilla, but not really a great deal else. Uh, he had some surgery to the right side of his nose a few years ago. Again, like most of our patients, he doesn't remember exactly what, uh, what, what, it, uh, what it entailed. Um, so you see that on the uh, uh, endoscopy in his right middle meatus. Uh, you organize a, uh, a CT, uh, and this is what you, uh, what you see on uh, CT. So... He's got a bit of right maxillary discomfort, dysosmia, and a foul post-nasal drip and a bit of rhinorrhea. Codrud, what would you do? What should I do with the patient? Yeah. I think it's a surgical case also because it was operated, you said. He's had an operation some time ago, yeah. Some but he's, time ago. He's, he's fresh to you and no treatment. That there are some remnants also from the, um, from the turbinate, which is a little bit lateralized there. You yeah. can see on the CT scan. And also a portion of the inferior ancinate. So I think I would complete the, the um, antrostomy, let's say a bigger one, and then a short course of corticosteroids, nasal lavage, and then taking care about uh, other symptoms that, that may occur. Okay, and, and so surgery straight off, yep. Teeth. Anybody, anybody do anything different? I would ask about the teeth, if he has any teeth problem. Why is it unilateral uh, acute maxillary, yeah. well, parallel maxillary sinusitis in one side? Yeah. I would want to know if there's any local uh, issue no, in most cases. Uh, he's got no dental, well, he says he's got no dental issues. He's seen a dentist recently, a dentist is happy. Uh, when you <laughs> see the whole series of the scans, there's, there's, no, there's no suggestion of any roots going through. How, how long has it been going on for, Sean? Oh, about three or four months. And presumably his GP will have given him various courses of antibiotics along that along Exactly the way. right. His GP has given him various courses of antibiotics along the way. Yeah. What was the longest course he had? About a week. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you can give him antibiotics. You do some microbiology, there's pus swab there, it, yeah. yep. swab it, see what it's growing and put him on a long course of a macrolide or doxycycline and, yeah. and then see him back. Yeah. Okay. Anybody do, do anything different? Yeah, you know, I, I just want to make the comment that I would probably culture it because we're going to operate on this patient and it might guide you to what antibiotic you give them post-op. And the other thing I just noticed that the uh, uh, roof of the maxillary sinus or floor, the orbit is pushed up, so you wonder about a mucosal yeah. or okay. is it just the way it, the yeah, CT slightly. is angled yeah. uh, with that. Okay. Does everybody have access to long-term macrolides? I know in some countries it's difficult to get to, to prescribe those. No, everybody seems to be. Um, no, I, well, I, do, I do have access. I think this is one where I'd probably discuss it with the patient, and you've got to take into account the patient factors because if he's, you know, he'd need to have an ECG before a 12-week course of, of macrolide. If he's, got, if he's on a statin... Yeah. cardiac history, then I'd probably be more inclined to push him towards surgery straight up rather than giving him a long course of antibiotics because this is a single sinus. He's got a chronic maxillary sinusitis. Yeah. You know you're going to fix it with a very simple operation. <laughs> so I think I'd probably give the patient the, the option of a long course of antibiotics versus surgery. And probably I think my practice has changed. So maybe five years ago, I'd have been pushing towards the antibiotics. And I think now I'd be much more inclined to go for surgery. Yeah. And, and if you went for surgery, what, what operation? I'd do an antrostomy and an antrostomy. Mm. The rest of his sinuses yeah. aren't affected. Big antrostomy, small antrostomy? <laughs> Moderate antrostomy. Moderate. <laughs> <laughs> Medium size. I don't, I don't think you, you don't need a massive antrostomy. You need, you need a big enough 
you know, you need to do a complete antenectomy, make sure he doesn't have an accessory ostium. Okay. Let's um, uh, show, show of hands, uh, small antrostomy and uh, big antrostomy. And sitting on the fence, antrostomy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's exactly... Do we exact know his uh, teeth are okay? Sorry? Teeth are okay. Teeth are okay, yeah. Yeah, well, so essentially he had a, a, a unilateral sinusitis uh, and he had a, a, an unsonectomy and a s small middle metal antrostomy, drained the pus, cultured it, and he was uh, he he settled down in a course of a couple of weeks of of, uh, of augmenting actually. So he was he was he was fine. Okay, let's move on to something a little bit more spicy. So this is a patient uh, who's an, an elderly lady. Uh, she's pretty fit and healthy. Uh, she's in her seventies, uh, and out of the blue, over the past. Uh, year, she's had two or three episodes of left-sided orbital cellulitis. She's never had any trouble with uh, her orbit before. Um, she, as I said, she's fit and healthy. She's not an asthmatic. She's not got any immune deficiency. Um, and she has, uh, she's had a, a, a bit of mucus in her uh, nose when she, when she blows her nose. Um, and she had some surgery done uh, about, uh, again, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, again, doesn't know exactly what it was, um, and when you look in her sinuses, I haven't shown you what's on the right-hand side, but that's what's on the left-hand side. Sorry, that's, that's the appearance, the endoscopy appearance on the right-hand side. So, uh, where should we start with? Joe, do you want to... Um... Sorry, so is that the... Obviously, the disease is in her left... Yeah. Is that supposed to be the left side of her nose? No, that's the right side of her nose. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> but the left's the same? The left's pretty similar. Okay. So, um, well, she's... With the, the reason that she's getting her orbital cellulitis is because she's got a dehiscence in the floor of the frontal sinus. Yeah. Um, and that's clearly the easiest way for this to, uh, to express itself. So she's otherwise fit and well. Yep. She clearly needs that left frontal sinus opening up. Shall I show you some more images? I think that would only, only be fair. So those are her uh, yeah. same series of scans, um, but that's her, uh, her images there. So the previous surgery that she's had, looking at the endoscopic picture, she's, she's not, she still had an unsonnet there, but it was, there were adhesions between the middle turbinate and the unsonnet. Um, mm. And looking at those scans, she looks, you know, she's got a good AP diameter of her frontal recess. It looks like it would be reasonably, reasonably straightforward to open it up. Um, if all of her symptoms, if her symptoms are only that recurrent left orbital cellulitis, I'd be inclined just to deal with the left side. Okay, yeah. But anybody, no argument for doing the anybody, any other side. thoughts? Hmm. So if you, if you have a little look at those uh, images, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to have to use a pointer here, but what do you think about that middle turbinate on each side? Does it look normal? It's it looks like it's been trimmed. And it does, doesn't it? Yeah. So what do you think might have, might have happened? Truncated middle turbinate and... Uh, her previous surgery. I'm, yeah. I it, it's essentially, if you look at it there, you can just about make out what's yeah. happening. Yeah. It's lateralised and it's sealed off the... Yeah. The, uh, the frontal sinus. So, Ian, how are you going to manage it? What are you going to do? Yeah, well, it's sort of an I iatrogenic frontal disease, probably, yeah. and uh, I would do uh, the simplest thing possible. So I'd start with trying to do a draft one, and if that didn't work, if it wasn't opening easily, do a two. But I wouldn't do anything elaborate. Okay. Would you consider treating med prime medically, prolonged course of antibiotics? Uh, Probably no, but you have that discussion with the patient and you talk about medical and surgical therapies, but I, my, I think my recommendation would be surgical opening if she's had several orbital cellulitis, so you want to get her in a quiescent period. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Richard, will you use uh, image guidance for this? Well, um, I agree with both of them. I think it's, not, it's quite an easy case. Um, I think you just open to a draft one. I don't even think it's necessary navigation for this case. Mm -hmm. I would beg to disagree here. Now, I would go for more extended uh, frontal sinus surgery. I would go, in my mind, for a draft three. It ticks the boxes in my, in my mind for a draft three. Number one, it has been operated before. 
Number two, there is clearly a tendency for uh, postoperative scar and stenosis. I don't think, um, and it's funny because people would say this is iatrogenic frontal sinusitis, but although the term is not appropriate, I would think postoperative is a more less um, judging term, postoperative, mm -hmm. because not necessarily the fault of the surgeon. I'm saying this because it, it has practical implications, not just terminology that. Maybe there is a tendency for a scarring that caused this, uh, it's not necessarily a bad technique or a bad surgeon, maybe there was a tendency for scarring. Maybe the way she heals, um, the way her healing goes, that uh, would make the outcome worse than, than the average patient. So, uh, in my mind, it, there would be a good argument. Plus, she has a significant complication, it's just the sinusitis. She has uh, a mucosil with erosion of the floor, leading to multiple episodes of optic cellulitis. So she ticks all the boxes for a more, in my, my mind, for more radical surgery. And I would prefer to do a, a low throat draft in here from the first uh, attempt. Anybody else do a low throat? Anybody else do a draft three? Um, I want to support the idea of draft three. Um, actually, this is a bilateral frontal disease, right? And uh, we cannot make sure well, she's, that- uh, She's th actually only got She's got a little bit of thick uh, yeah. there, but it's she's got no natural, on But uh, the frontal recess of the right side is not good, it's not functioning. So in the long term, he can develop the right side of frontal sinus disease. Um, and the mucosal function of the frontal recess of both sides are not, should not be good because of the scarring. We see the, the, the trim of middle turbinate, the lateral lines of that part. Yeah. Right, so, so I think in the long term, we should manage bilateral frontal sinus disease with drop three. Okay, Ian? Yeah, I'll just throw, yeah, I'm not adverse to a draft three, but I think you said she's an 80-something-year-old. She's in her 70s, yeah. Oh, 70, uh, so it's an elderly person with unilateral disease. Um, in my mind, hasn't had good surgery the entire, if, if the right side is representative of the left, she still has her entire unsonate process. So uh, I don't know about you, but I get patients sent to me with a, a long laundry list of all the surgery, bilateral, ethmoid bilateral, antroid bilateral, front bilateral, and all they have is some adhesions mm -hmm. in the nose. Yeah. And so I'd hate to think that the audience would, you know, rush into uh, you know, major surgery because, you know, experts like you guys are good at this, but I think a lot of the um, rhinology community or general otolaryngology community wouldn't be comfortable uh, doing a, a low throb. So I think people have to be comfortable doing a, a draft one or two A, you know, something simple that will probably work in the majority of patients. So this is actually quite an, quite an old case. Um, but I thought it was, it was an interesting one because um, it sort of highlights the importance of trying to preserve as much of the middle turbinate as you can. Um, and we uh, sorted this out actually by doing a, um, a, a Kuhn uh, frontal sinus rescue procedure. So when the uh, middle turbinate is attached to the uh, lamina papyracea uh, by dividing it from that and then filleting out the bone the middle turbine up to the skull base and f flapping that across uh, medially. Um, in fact, when we did that, uh, we just got a rush of pus out of her middle meters, uh, out of her, uh, sorry, her frontal recess. And in fact, that's, it, it settled down after that. Um, so she had relatively limited um, disease and uh, it was just her good fortune that she didn't need anything, uh, anything more than that. But uh, we, I suspect we don't, seem to, we don't see so much of that now because, uh, well, certainly in, in the UK, we don't see so much in middle turbinate uh, resection. Sean, can I make a comment? Uh, yeah. we, we didn't see all of the slices, but I'm not sure actually how much you would gain from doing a low throat procedure in her case anyway. It looks like she's got a high AP diameter, which is what you want, but I think that sagittal slice is through one of the lateral sides. And if you look at the way her frontal sinuses are, in fact, they go more laterally and there's a low cribriform plate. So the, the area where you're gonna get the most gain is laterally. Um, what the Lothrop procedure gives you is an e excellent access if you've got anterior pneumatization and not a, a cribriform plate coming more anteriorly where your frontals are more 
um, pneumatizing via, via a supraorbital approach. We don't have all the slices, so I, c I can't guarantee that, but I'm, I'm not sure that a low throat would have gained you everything that you wanted to do here. It may, may have left you with one of those kidney-shaped frontal sinuses that are very narrow in the mm. middle, you know, because the cribriform plate's coming so far forward. It's difficult to tell, I think. Without the extra slides, yeah. you cannot, it does seem that most of the problem is more posteriorly, while the Lothrop yeah. will give you more access anteriorly, right? That's what, but we need, yeah, we wouldn't be able to tell you without more. And she has got a bit of disease in her, in her ethmoids, residual disease in her ethmoids, but actually when you look at the maxillae, uh, and I had the, the benefit of more scans than this, and her sphenoid, they're relatively healthy. Um, so it does look like it's predominantly a local problem. Um, and uh, and, as, it, and it, as it turned out, actually, it was, it was uh, treated relatively um, uh, conservatively and, and settled down. Did you operate on both sides? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Why did you operate on the right side when she didn't have symptoms? Uh, well, she, um, she, she didn't really have symptoms on the right side, but it just opened up her ethmoids, completed the procedure on the, uh, the right-hand side. So, but, uh, uh, yeah, nothing more, nothing more than that. Okay, so here's a, a similar sort of case, but this is a, um, uh, a, a gentleman in his uh, 60s uh, who's had uh, sinus surgery previously. Uh, he, again, isn't very sure of what, uh, what he's had done, um, but uh, he remembers having an operation a few years ago uh, and it made his symptoms better. Uh, he had blockage and mucus and, and purulence. Uh, and uh, he presents to you with uh, a couple of episodes of, uh, of left-sided orbital cellulitis. Joe, what would you think about this one? Was, again, it is a bit difficult to tell without, without more slices because I want to know if there was any uh, loss of the frontal sinus floor on this one as well. He's getting orbital cellulitis. No, so in fact, the, um, the, the roof of the orbit's pretty good all the way back. He's, he's pretty good all the way back. Mm -hmm. So again, he has, based on this, sort of isolated left frontal disease. Maybe he's got a bit of thickening in the, mags in the antrum there. Yeah. Um, He's got a few residual ethmoid septations that you can see on the sagittal, but his sphenoid's clear. Um, and again, if his issues are... How old is this one? He's about 60. I think if his issues, again, are all left-sided yeah. left um, and there is no disease on the right, then I think you could opt to treat him in the same way. Okay. So with a full house... Uh, completing his full house fares on the, on the left. No, but I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't go for a primary lothrop on him. Well, I wouldn't do a lothrop straight out on him. Okay. Did Christoph? the patient receive oh. antibiotics or steroids? He hasn't had any treatment from you as yet. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't go. This, on the other hand, is a patient that I would not do a lothrop on. And um, the reason is not only that he's 60 years old, that he has isolated disease on, uh, on the left side. It doesn't have a complication. Plus, here, the anteroposterior diameter is relatively narrow. He has a lot of bone in the area of the nasal beak, yeah. and I would be very uh, worried that the draft tree would close. So in this case, and he has a typical pattern of uh, disease in someone who has been operated with a zero degree endoscope going towards the sphenoid. You can see that he has cleared mm -hmm. the posterior ethmoids in the area of the sphenoid. Yeah. He has isolated anterior ethmoids frontal disease. So I think a draft A in this case, would, um, would be the best, uh, in my hands, I mean, I think it would be the best course of action. A limited frontal sinus uh, opening. Uh, to a... Kodru, would you do anything, anything different? No, I completely agree Yeah. in this case. So let's, but let's see. But also it depends, as they said, about some <coughs> other slides, some details yeah. to see on the CT scan. Okay, the other slides don't, it... don't really show you much more than that. <laughs> but would you, would you stent him? Would you put a stent in there? To put a stent there? Yeah. Let's say you open that up. Would you leave it open or would you think about stenting it? No, I'm usually not agree so much the stents. Okay. Maybe when we are performing open procedures, sometimes we are putting stents, but I'm not a fan of the stents. Okay. Anybody a fan of stents in the frontal recess? <laughs> not a stent. But it is, I, I always use uh, for 10 days a small silicone um, um, leaf 
when I use when I do draft three and then I place after that the flap to keep it in place. I don't know if it would count as a stent or as a spacer or as a kind of a, but it, it helps to support the the, the graft okay. the, in the neostom and <laughs> it's removed after two weeks. A small silicone uh, um, sheet. sheet yeah, yes. okay. yeah, I'll just mention I, I haven't had the opportunity to use them yet, but in the uh, in the U.S. there's uh, stents that are available that the uh, slow releasing mimetazone. Yeah type drug eluting stents are, are interesting as well as there's some sort of homemade ones with sponges putting Kenalog into them as sort of a drug eluting stent in the frontal recess. But they're, they're so expensive that we just don't have them available routinely, in, at least in Canada. Does anybody else have access to drug eluting, eluting stents? No. Nope. Don't need them. Don't use them. They haven't crossed the Atlantic or the uh, Pacific yet. <laughs> okay, so this, this fellow uh, had a trial of uh, medical treatment uh, in the form of uh, prolonged antibiotics and, uh, uh, and steroids. Um, he, he didn't settle down and ended up having a, uh, a completion ethmoidectomy and a, uh, finding the anterior ethmoid and then a, and a, then a draft uh, uh, 2A. Um, and uh, you can see the sort of... Uh, he actually had pretty healthy mucosa, a little bit of uh, edema uh, there laterally, but uh, it all sort of settled, uh, settled down. And, and I think what really I wanted to, to, to do with these last few cases was, was illustrate the, the, the common problems in revision surgery. So it, it's usually down to incomplete uh, removal of disease. And, and I think Christos made a very good point about the use of a zero degree scope for doing the operation entirely. Um, so you miss those. Uh, lamellae uh, anteriorly, um, a failure to take down the uncinate, uh, over resection of the middle turbinate, uh, a failure to perform a, a proper middle metal antrostomy, the usual causes of um, uh, uh, issues uh, requiring revision surgery. Are there any other sort of common causes that any of the panel would think in their experience are, are, are issues for people who are, who are performing sinus surgery that they ought to consider when they're doing the primary case to minimize the risk of, of revision? I think you need to try and avoid, you know, as, as all the textbooks say, avoid circumferential instrumentation of the frontal recess. The slightly curved olive-tipped olive sucker is actually a very bad culprit for that because people yeah. think, oh, look, there's the frontal. I'll just see if I can get any mucus out. And they ram the curved sucker up there, and that does circumferentially traumatize the mucosa. I think you should avoid doing that. Okay. I think, I think there's a training issue in that we're, we're all taught that using an angled telescope was dangerous. Uh, and endoscopic sinus surgery is taught and learnt using a zero degree scope. And many uh, surgeons are still frightened of using a 30 degree and a 45 and haven't really worked out the optics of it as well. Because yep. I, I think the the, the idea that a 30 degree is dangerous in the frontal recess is not true. You know, if you, you're going to get better, better imaging with it. It, it. It's a matter of kind of changing the culture, I think, and saying, yeah. you know, you need to use, as the other surgical specialties do, you need to use a range of optics okay. when you're doing a case. Yeah, I'll just reiterate, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so we usually have 30, 45, and 70 ready for frontal recess dissection. I think one of the, I, I don't know this for a fact, but my impression has been uh, that people will sort of take a curette and sort of bounce around in the frontal recess hoping to find something and um, they're, they're thinking they're going to do a frontal sinusotomy if they can get in easily and then they can't and so they stop and then they've created more harm than good and so they don't really complete, they sort of go in with a hope and then it doesn't finish. And then that's, uh, a lot, most of my frontal sinus practice is still iatrogenic uh, from, from others. Because yeah. you look at their original CT scan, it looks completely clear. Well, I, I also agree with the telescope. It's very difficult to operate with, just with the zero degrees on the frontal sinus. And I, I also have most of my frontal cases are iatrogenic, as you said, because normally the surgeon does not take so much care and takes too much mucosa out, and then you have more problem than before. So you have to be very careful when you open the, the frontal recess to preserve this mucosa. 
I think that's that's more, most important. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, let's move on to this case now. So this is another asthmatic. Um, he's uh, he's had a long history of nasal obstruction. He's had numerous polypectomies in the past. Uh, he's now just begun to notice that uh, his right eye um, is bulging a little bit. It's only it's only very minimal. In fact, his, his wife just happened to uh, to comment upon it. He's got no visual disturbance. Um, but he comes up and uh, you look in his uh, nose after taking a history and he's got a nose full of polyps and he's got some mucus coming past all of those polyps and you, um, and you arrange some CT imaging there. Uh, now, I appreciate that we've only got a couple of views and I'm afraid I'm not going to give you more than that. Uh, but Cornicat, what, um, what's going through your head uh, when, you, uh, when you see those images? So um, I think this patient has massive polyposis and uh, the drainage of the frontal sinus has been obstructed. So I think there is a mucosal there that um, compressing the orbit and eroding the posterior wall of frontal sinus. Yeah. Yeah. What so, about? Yeah. So we should uh, plan for, um, for the drainage of that mucosal to open it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the frontal sinus is highly pneumatized for both sides, right? For both left and right. Yeah, let's say, let's say it is it's well pneumatized and there's a good AP diameter. Yeah. Um, so there'll be plenty of room for, for surgery there. So in the long term, we need to control this uh, massive polyposis and TH2 inflammation by providing the access for the long-term topical therapies, including steroid irrigation, and uh, let the mucosal drain from the right frontal sinus to the ethmoid sinus and also to the left frontal sinus. So I would do full half face and wrap three. Yeah. Is there anything you'd think about doing before, before that? Um, would, you, would you ask for any more imaging or would you just go ahead and operate on that? Um, I, I do not plan to remove that mucosa at, at yeah. that area. So I think I would go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Would anybody think about doing an MR in that yeah. case, or would I mean, you just? Generally, I, I personally I like to do an, whenever there is a suggestion of intraorbital or intracranial extension, I do an MRI. Now, in most cases, it doesn't change the management yeah. because you know that the mucosal will stop at the periorbita or intracranial will stop at the dura. Uh, still, uh, without saying that without an MRI I will not proceed, I would rather have an MRI as well before the surgery. Just because of the intraorbital extension. Okay, let's have a show of hands. MRI, who would MRI? Okay, that's fine. All right. So let's, let's assume uh, that we decide we're going to do a, a, a low throb in this patient. And you do a low throb, and uh, he's really happy for the first few months. And then he comes back and it's stenosed, and you reopen it and it stenoses again. Would you, uh, would you consider an external approach on this, this fella? Richard, would you? Well, um, as it was said, it looks like a, a mucosal, and I would try from below, as, as you did. Of course, if there's, any, if, if there's no other option, you can open also from above, but always looking from below also. Yeah. Um, but I, I think um, I would try from below as even two or three or four times before opening from above room. Okay. Paul, I saw you putting your head forward there. Yeah, it's a, it's a high stakes case. Uh, I think this is a sort of patient that you're going to sit down and spend a lot of time with and work, w go over the diagnosis again. What's the eosinophil count? What's, what's the IgE level? Is there a place for monoclonal antibody treatment? Surgery wise, if your low throps failed, I think I'd seriously consider doing an osteoplastic flap with a lothrop, because if your lothrop's failed, it, um, you've got stenosis of your frontal sinusotomy. And by doing an osteoplastic flap, I wouldn't obliterate. I think that's a bad idea. Why, why wouldn't you obliterate? Why wouldn't I obliterate? Yeah. Because I think it's very difficult to be 100% sure you've got every epithelial cell out. Yep. And if you obliterate with fat or bone patty or something like that and, and the patient comes back with headache or a current swelling, you're left with this dilemma of not knowing. 
yeah. you know, what's going on in there. At least with a Lothrop procedure, you're always going to be able to debride it and, and see inside. And what an osteoplastic flap would do if the original Lothrop failed is make it a bit more effective and also give you the opportunity for the sinus to reduce in volume. Yeah. A bit like the way the old corbal luck used to work. Mm. You know, you see some of these corbal luck patients and you look into their lateral wall and the maxillary sinus is almost merged with the lateral wall. Uh, but I, I wouldn't formally obliterate. Yeah. What about you, Jill? Um, I think, I, again, I would reopen the Lothrop endoscopically. I think... How many times would you reopen? Oh, at least two or three. And I'd be definitely be going down the, the medical therapy side of it. If yep. he's, you know, very eosinophilic, then you might want to consider longer-term steroids or steroid-sparing agents or monoclonals. I generally, I think, I sort of see your rationale with the osteoplastic flap, but I kind of think if you've got the access from below the sort of external approach really when you haven't got the access as much. But I do take your point about the, getting the sinus to contract. Well, you've also got disease which is well beyond the mid-orbital level. Um, yeah. It's going pretty lateral there. And uh, uh, my worry would be you're not going to... Having said that, we don't see all the slices, so we don't know what the AP yeah. diameter and such like is. But I, th I think you're going to have this patient for the... Mm. the rest of his or your life, whichever is longer. <laughs> that's, the, that's the one certainty of this case, isn't it? He's not, going to, uh, he's not going to go away. I think, I mean, what Paul was saying, there's a very good point uh, about you can't really obliterate something that's got a um, no. dehiscent uh, uh, dura because you're, you're not going to get the mucose off of that. So unless you remove the dura, which converts a big operation into an even bigger operation, um, then you're going to run the risk of uh, leaving mucosal cells and... Uh, uh, and, and running into uh, to problems in the future. So we, 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 ju we are repeating his, uh, his, his low throb from, uh, from time to time. And actually, his, his disease load is, is beginning to settle down, actually, with a, a, a full house fez uh, and uh, a, um, a removal of the disease from his uh, frontal sinuses. He is, he is better now than he, uh, than he has been, but he's not, uh, uh, he's not got over uh, uh, the disease completely. Okay, so we're talking about Lothrops, and uh, here's a picture of a, a Lothrop. Here's an early stage, uh, later stage. This is without any sort of flaps in place. Um, and uh, actually, this one's sort of settled down pretty nicely. This was, a, again, an ASA triad. They don't tend to heal up uh, as well as uh, if you're doing it for, uh, uh, for, for non-inflammatory disease. But um, unfortunately, this happens from time to time. So... Fortunately, not that often, but this is a fella who had uh, uh, ASA, um, uh, Sampter Triad uh, disease. Uh, he'd had numerous operations. He'd had lots of instrumentation uh, in his frontal sinus before he got to us. He uh, not only did have horrible mucosal disease with thickened spicated uh, mucus, but he also had new bone formation. Um, and what we're looking at here is, uh, is, is exuberant scar tissue. Uh, leading up from the nasal passage into that, uh, into that uh, frontal ostium up there. And this was about six weeks after his, uh, his surgery. So how, how, how would you manage that? What would you do about that, Ian? Uh, I'd refer him to you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so fortunately, unfortunately, I have lots of experience with this. Um, so you have to sort of step back and say, is there any other medical therapies that might be of benefit? So these people we would have on uh, topical steroids, systemic steroids, debriding them on a weekly basis, um, trying to get through, consider some of these drug eluding stents uh, that would go into the sinus. I uh, personally, I have them on a topical, uh, uh, I use a topical ear drop actually, the ciprofloxacin dexamethasone drop that they put in, in addition to pulmocord and saline rinses and prednisone and debridements and yep. um, prayer uh, with that. Yep. What do you think about the drug illusion therapy, putting there in the cavities some devices which have some corticosteroids long-lasting? Yeah, the, well, the ones that I've had... Americans have this, uh, this kind yeah. of... The ones I've used is the... Um, uh, the sponges and putting the kenalog into it and leaving them in 
mm -hmm. in place. Yeah. Uh, and then I change them out every two weeks type of thing. And that's sort of, I don't know if whether it's stenting or drug eluding or what it's doing, but uh, sometimes it works. Mm -hmm. Because I spoke several times with PJ Catalan, you know, he, he is one of the fans of this method. And he, in such cases, he told me that it works. I do not, not, okay. not yeah. have any, any experience with this kind. Kornikat, what, what would you do in this case? Yeah, one thing is uh, when the steroid recation it's not working, I let the patient change the position to be uh, to make that position so the steroid can reach the low top cavity better than upright position. Um, for steroid eluting, um, I think it's too expensive for, for my country. Yeah. Um, and one thing is we do not just want steroid to be there, but we want to irrigate the eosinophilic mucin so I, I would prefer to do steroid irrigation with appropriate head position. At six weeks, I mean, I think the good thing is that the good news is that this is happening at six weeks, not at six months. So there's still a chance that this is the, the very proliferative phase and will settle down. What I used sometimes, I'm not sure it works, but I used a curved uh, suction catheter with the syringe and some um, steroid ointment, triamkilon, and try to insert it there to the neostomy and hope that it will help with, uh, with healing. Yeah. I'm not sure it works or some oral steroid in such cases. But this could well heal after two or three months. You can see a, a really settled down mucosa. So he, I, I, I did a lot of that. I um, used topical therapy on him um, and uh, it actually over the next couple of weeks or so it seemed to get worse, um, <laughs> unfortunately, and as, as did his symptoms. Um, so I, uh, I kind of forced myself into some action and uh, I debrided some of that. I didn't debride it all back and then I injected some triamcinolone in, uh, in uh, sub, -muco well, sub, sub scar um, and it, it, it's, it began to settle down and actually about three to four months out all of that uh, hypertrophic, because it is a sort of hypertrophic scar, uh, actually uh, settled down and he ended up with quite a small uh, uh, meatus uh, into his frontal sinus, but fortunately, uh, it seems to be uh, uh, holding things, and I haven't had to go back in and uh, and do anything more about him. But uh, he was a uh, he was a, a bit of a head headache, both uh, literally and uh, metaphorically, unfortunately. Um, but uh, you, that's the, what happens, unfortunately, in, in some cases, uh, which we, I suppose we were talking about earlier, where you get complete stenosis of the uh, of the frontal ostium. So I'm going to I'm going to move on now. Let's let's get out of the. Uh, the front, well, let's do one more in the frontal sinus because this is quite an interesting fella. Um, this is a, um, uh, a gent who actually uh, lives, uh, I suppose, what you might call up country. <laughs> so he doesn't, he doesn't come into town very much. Uh, and he's been living with this for about two years. Uh, and his wife just got fed up with it uh, and sent him to the uh, plastic surgeons. Uh, uh, and to the uh, plastic surgeon uh, did a biopsy of the skin, uh, and it came back as, uh, well, surprisingly, unsurprisingly, it came back as inflammatory tissue. Um, so no big, uh, no big surprise there, but actually when you looked at it in a bit more detail, uh, he had a, uh, a discharging sinus there, and he'd had that for a, for a couple of years, actually, and, 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 you know, you look at him, he's happy as Larry, he's not particularly bothered about it. It was more of his wife that was bothered about it uh, than, uh, than he was. He didn't really have much in the way of nasal symptoms. He had a bit of a stuffy nose, but you know, in rhinology, if you ask anybody who's got a blocked nose, they'll tell you you do if you ask the question the wrong way. Um, he had a bit of um, uh, reduced sense of smell, but, but he was um, otherwise pretty much asymptomatic, so he hasn't spoken for a while. Yeah, Christos. It's, uh... <laughs> Uh, well, it's a, it's a, um, a frontocutaneous fistula. It's a frontocutaneous fistula, actually. Uh, we've published a couple of these. And um, I would want, a, of course, a CT and an MRI to see the condition of the frontal sinus. Most likely, he has an obstructed frontal okay. rhesus. Yeah, okay. So he's, uh, that's, and, his, uh, and that's his CT scan. And, the MR, and he has, yeah, I was going to say, in these cases, you're worried about the posterior hole as well as the anterior hole of the frontal sinus because the same process that caused the anterior breach could well cause a posterior breach, such yeah. as here. And an MRI would be useful to appreciate the extent of intracranial... Christos, for you. ...involvement. <laughs> yes. Uh, it seems that, uh, well, on the... On the coronal, on the sagittal, it looks 
It's not very clear. I'm not sure to what extent the dura is um, is inflamed or involved. It certainly reaches up to the dura. So his, du his dura, thankfully, is intact, and he's it, got this inflammatory disease here, which mm. is coming out to well, is essentially a subcutaneous mm. abscess, which is uh, draining onto the uh, onto mm, the does. skin there. So you can see that on the uh, axial cut. But if we go back to his uh, his uh, his CTs, is this a is this a nice, easy, straightforward case to do? To manage. No. How are you? What, what are you? What are you going to? How are you going to manage this? I, I would. Um, me? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, the the way I would manage the way we manage this is to get a very wide. Um, and drain it. So what you want is to, it's like in all fistulas, it's, it's the result of an outflow that has been blocked, you cannot yep. uh, find any other way out. So you need to create a significant outflow through the nose. So I would go for a draft three. That's what we did actually, we had two cases with fistula. We did a draft three. Being aware, the problem is that there may be osteomyelitis. So if they're after the outflow, so the first step would be to stop the obstruction and create some outflow. So the pus is drained. And then the second, what we did is to remove the part of the skin that has been uh, involved, the fistula, and then reconstruct, close the skin. And then the question is what to so, do so with the uh, infected just, osteomyelitic just one, bone. Hang on, one, one second. So you're, you're going to excise that skin and how are you going to, you said reconstruct it. What and do you mean by reconstruct it? Just close it. In most cases, just... Uh, All right. Uh, so primary closure. Close, yeah. Primary closure. But um, it depends to what extent the bone is involved, whether it's a long-term chronic osteomyelitis. Will the bone heal? Two does, years. Yeah. Because the second way of doing it, the, the way we did it in both cases with the draft three, is to do an external osteoplastic uh, approach. In this case, you are able to drill out the, osteo the osteotic bone, but then you need a second operation to provide the drainage from below okay. to create the draft three. So, he's, so Christos is going for full, full action, full on action. Anybody do anything any different? No, I consider that the combined approach, okay. starting with this frontal, Okay, so combine External it. External approach and then completing with the endoscopic approach of the other sinuses. It should be the best operation here. How extensive is the osteitis? Sorry? Uh, how extensive is the ost osteitis? Well, it, it is pretty extensive, isn't it? Well, you can see. Because uh, you might want to do isotope scanning to get an idea. Posterior table. Because it, if, if it's very extensive osteitis. All that new bone formation all you, the way through his ethmoids. Yeah, you, well, dead bone. And if this, this is a, a, a guy who probably doesn't want to keep coming back to try different things, he might be one that you have to do a rital procedure on. Yeah. No mucking around. Ian? Uh, this is the type of case that I would do a, a gallium or white blood cell tag scan just to see with that, because it might help uh, with your therapy as well. And I'd involve infectious disease and yeah. get the person going on IV antibiotics preoperatively. And then usually would make an incision in the forehead, plus or minus res re resection of skin, but you'd want to remove any devitalized bone back to bleeding bone. And then... Um, from above and below, you can easily do a, a, a low throb to, to drain that. Richard? No, I, th I think this patient, it's very high. Uh, he has infection in the bone. You have to take that out. If you don't take that bone out, you won't resolve the problem this patient. So you have to open from above and from below. Yeah. Both. Well, the, the first thing, I suppose, in, in, to summarize is that this is, this is an uncommon problem. So I, I must say in 20 years, I've seen a couple of, a couple of these, don't see very many of them in, uh, in the uh, sort of sunny climes of, of, uh, of Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Um, and it is, a, it is a real challenge, this, because he's got inflammatory disease. He's got a lot of new bone formation. Uh, he's got multiple uh, defects in his, uh, his uh, frontal sinus, and he's from up country. And uh, when I put it to him that he might need a big operation, he had that look in his face that if I let him out of my uh, uh, eyesight, he would be out the door like a uh, rabbit down a, uh, uh, a rabbit hole. So uh, we came to a, a mutual understanding um, that we would involve infectious disease. So he was, he was up for that. Um, but I explained to him at the, at, the, at the very least, we would have to um, uh, take him to theater, open up those maxillae, um, to get some pus for uh, culture and to allow me to have a, a, um, 
uh, a look at his, uh, his frontal sinus as well from uh, below. So essentially, I consented him uh, for a, uh, an, uh, an EUA, uh, bilateral middle metal antrostomies, uh, partial ethmoidectomy, and uh, uh, an exploration of his, uh, his, his frontal sinuses. When I talked about doing anything more than that, um, he was completely aghast. He was, he was not up for having anything that might leave him with a whole lot of crusting in his nose. So I kind of took him to theatre with a bit of uh, trepidation, really. Um, his middle metal antrostomies were really easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the, oper the operation wasn't quite so easy. But having said that, as I took away his, um, took away his uncinate, opened up the, uh, uh, his uh, antralateral cells, uh, we got some pus out of both of uh, his, uh, his frontal sinuses, and, uh, uh, and I kind of left it that, put him on the, back on the ward, and start him off on uh, IV antibiotics. And in fact, once he was cultured um, and on long-term antibiotics, he settled down. He settled down completely, in fact. Um, we didn't have to do anything more um, at all. Uh, he was on antibiotics for about four months. Uh, I can't remember exactly what we had him on. He was on triple therapy with metronidazole. Uh, and uh, when we rescanned him uh, uh, at about uh, 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 completion of treatment, all the disease in his uh, frontal sinuses um, had pretty much settled down. He had a bit of mucosal thickening in the, uh, in the sinuses themselves. The maxillae were looking healthy. His ethmoids had kind of settled down as well. And I suspect it was just those, those long-term IV antibiotics that had done the, uh, done the trick. And that was about eight years ago. Um, I haven't seen anything of him since, but I suspect after all of that, he wasn't going to come to down country again, no matter what, uh, what happened. So, Sometimes less is, less is more, um, but it's very easy retrospectively to, uh, uh, to make a decision. Right, let's go for something, something different. Okay, this, this fellow, uh, I'm going to take you through his images, actually. He presented to a colleague of mine, um, and he presented with a, a foul-smelling unilateral nasal discharge uh, as a new patient. Uh, he had a, uh, a CT because he had a big uh, polyp on the left-hand side, nothing on the right-hand side. Um, and that's his CTs there. So I know uh, this isn't a revision case, but uh, Cornicat, any, any sort of comments uh, uh, um, on this case? I can, what would, um, you, what would you do? It's a unilateral disease. I see calcification in the maxillary sinus. Um, so I, I would do a revision surgery because definitely it is a surgical case. So this is yeah this is a, this is actually the primary case. Oh, it's primary. Uh, sorry, but he uh, he's no disease on the right hand side. But he, you're quite right. He's got a pan sinusitis on the left hand side. Interestingly, he's got that defect on the floor of his uh, sphenoid, and he's it's just all a bit sort of ropey around the um, pterygopalatine fossa there, and that's the uh, the soft tissue view there. Any. <laughs> Um, so took a biopsy from the nose. So yeah, he had a biopsy. Didn't uh, didn't yeah. uh, come back as anything malignant. Uh, <laughs> from the the axial wheel, um, I see the hypoostosis of the the yeah. wall of the maxillary sinus and calcification in there in the cavities and bone erosion. So to me, it looked like chronic invasive fungal rhinosinusitis. Yeah, so. so he actually grew candida on his, uh, yeah. on his swabs. He was diabetic, but he didn't, he wasn't on any, uh, he didn't have any other forms of uh, immunosuppression. So he seemed to do pretty well. Um, and then uh, he was booked to come back, but uh, uh, he didn't come back until um, he developed a third nerve palsy uh, in that uh, left eye. And I'll, I'll take you through his, uh, MR uh, images, and uh, in fact, we'll go that far. Um, Joe, what would you say, what would you sort of comment on those, about those MRs? Okay. Okay, he's got a lot of fluid in the, uh, in the sinuses. Um, yeah. But his, well, his disease is coming backwards, going into his pterygopalatine fossa, and then heading backwards into his, the lateral wall of his sphenoid and into his cavernous sinus if he's yeah. got a third nerve palsy. Yeah, so he's, his disease has, uh, has progressed somewhat. Um, how would you manage that? So he needs, uh, surgically, he needs 
surgical clearance of the disease and you need to involve infectious diseases as well because he's it's probably it's probably an invasive yep. rather than a non-invasive um, chronic sinusitis so he may well given his um we need to involve his diabetes team to optimize his diabetic control and you're going to need to involve infectious diseases because he may well need some long-term yep. antifungals okay so you're quite right how, how extensive would your surgery be I, I know we haven't got lots of scans there but are you how, how far are you going to chase that back? I mean, you're quite right, you've identified all the disease. He's actually got disease in his orbital apex as well. You can see uh, not quite so clearly on that image there, but it, goes, it does go all the way back. How, how, extensive are you going to, how extensive is your surgery going to be? Well, I think you, to treat him properly, you're going to have to be a, a pretty aggressive. Yep. You're going to need to try and clear it all out. Um, back. So is, is his acuity normal? It's just is the third nerve acuity palsy. is normal. At the moment, yeah. I think I think you do need to try and clear all of it out. So you chase you chase the disease you can you can see. I think so. Okay. Yeah. It, it, without trying trying to avoid doing him any harm from a additional okay. cranial nerve issue, put a point of view. Anybody else do anything? And bearing in mind that you, he's going to get antifungal yeah. treatment afterwards, yep. so chase it as as far as you safely can. Yeah. I think. Anybody, anything different? No? Okay, so that's what he had. He had, a, uh, he had a, 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 a revision procedure where we took down the whole of the medial wall of the maxilla, took his turbinates out, uh, did a full uh, ethmoidectomy and cleared out that, uh, into that pterygopalatine fossa uh, and chased it back into, uh, towards his cavernous sinus. It didn't bleed very much, um, but a lot of dead tissue came out, dead bone. Um, and I took him round to uh, fin finish the procedure, didn't put a pack in his nose, he went round to recovery, um, and then I went to get, uh, to get changed, and as, I, as we always do, after, recover, uh, after we get changed, we go around and see him, how are you getting on? Oh, I'm absolutely fine, doctor, but I'm, uh, I can't see out my left eye now. So he'd gone, he was, he was now blind in his left eye in, in recovery. Well, that's not strictly true. He wasn't completely blind, but he was having difficulty uh, counting fingers. There was no what, packing. What, in... what do I do now? There was no packing in his nose. There's no packing in his nose. No. Was his eye propped toast? No, his eye, his eye wasn't propped toast. His eye was fine. His, his mobility was as it was beforehand, but his visual acuity had diminished. Call a friend, get some imaging. Yeah. A friend, yeah. Okay, so that's exactly what I did. I uh, went uh, through to my colleague and said, uh, Do you want to come and have a look at this? Because I haven't seen this before. Um, so my colleague came through and he said, You know, you're right, he can't see out that left eye very well, <laughs> which is really helpful, isn't it? You <laughs> kind of hope that he would be able to elicit something a bit better than that. Um, so, yeah, we, um, we, uh, we, we sent him um, down for, uh, for a further MR scan, uh, which I don't have. Um, but actually, the net, the, the, and, and yeah, why would I be looking for a further M MRI scan? I shouldn't be telling you the whole story. Uh, Cornicat, do you want to tell us what, what would you be looking for on that, uh, that subsequent MR scan of this patient who's lost his vision on the left side? Mm. Uh, yeah, I would request an MRI scan for, yeah, to assess the, the optical problem on the left side. Yeah. What, what do you think I was particularly worried about? Uh, I, I do not understand the question. Sorry, so, ask me so again. So I, as I was standing there phoning up the radiologist saying I need an urgent MRI scan, which is not something I do very often, thankfully. Um, but what do you think I was really worried about? <laughs> I was worried I'd taken a chunk out of his optic nerve, actually. So, oh, the optic. so uh, we, got a, we got another MRI scan. Unfortunately, it, the MRI scan didn't look any different um, in the uh, orbital uh, apex than it had done um, previously. So what do you think had probably happened? Maybe a thrombosis? It could, by, could well have been. Or there was some, uh, I had a patient, well, basically by using the bipolar very close, not to the optic nerve, it was the third nerve, and he had a transient palsy just by using the, trying to get some hemostasis in the area, in that area. Yeah. So it's probably a bit of edema around the, uh, the orbital apex, a tight orbital apex mm. uh, that caused a reduction in his, uh, in his vision. So, mm. uh, 
Again, I phoned another friend. I phoned the, uh, my ophthalmology uh, colleague, my oculoplastic colleague, and he said, um, he said, I think you ought to phone an infectious disease and see what we can, we can put him on. So we sort of went round and round circles for a bit and decided to put him on high doses of steroids, which kind of is counterintuitive for uh, uh, invasive fungal sinusitis. But he went on high dose of uh, steroids for a week uh, and uh, on and high dose of uh, 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 voriconazole uh, therapy. Unfortunately, his, his, uh, his, his vision came back after... Uh, there was noticeable improvement after a few days, but actually it took... Um, several months for his um, for his vision to um, to uh, to return, and actually on on long term uh, voriconazole, um, his his symptoms have uh, have improved, and his third nerve palsy uh, has uh, improved as well. Uh, although you can see his MR scan uh, quite a few months down the line still doesn't show uh, complete no uh, normal appearance uh, compared to the uh, to the uh, to the other side. Okay, we've got, we've got about 10 more minutes, so I will do one more case and we'll move to a completely different uh, sinus. So, this is a patient um, who my, uh, my colleague is uh, from uh, one of our local hospitals sent up and uh, he'd, uh, the patient had a, a unilateral nasal polyp. He'd taken a biopsy and it came back as, uh, as inverting papilloma. And... Uh, He'd, uh, he phoned me up and said, I've, I've removed all of the, uh, the polyp here. Uh, patient's um, absolutely fine. Um, I just wondered, can we just, uh, we can, can we leave it at that? The inverting papilloma has been reported histologically normal. Um, I didn't go into the sphenoid, but I'm a, and, and I, this, this is what the sphenoid looks like. Um, can, we, um, can we just leave that alone and, and maybe watch it by serial CT imaging? So, uh, Paul, would you think about watching that by serial CT imaging? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, inverting, papilloma, uh, 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 inverting papilloma is a surgical disease. Um, if you leave it, it will continue to increase in volume and there's a, t a small risk of malignant change. And in this case, there already has been some skull base erosion in the region of the left cavernous sinus. It's a difficult case. It's a uh, large sphenoid sinus with pterygoid extensions. Um, so high stakes, you need to inform the patient that and consider um, an appropriate surgical pro approach to remove the disease. Um, and you need some MRI imaging to work out if there's any intracranial extent um, usually, in my experience with this, you're quite lucky. It, it takes a long time to invade into cranially. This doesn't look like it has particularly. No, they write it. Um, so you want wide exposure of the sphenoid, probably involving a pterygopalatine extension of your sphenoidotomy so you can get complete clearance uh, of the disease um, back to healthy mucosa or dura, and then close monitoring for at least three years. Okay, yeah. so um, what would you, how would you counsel the patient um, for surgery in this particular case? Well, I'd, I'd explain to them what inverting papilloma is. Uh, I'd say it is a, it is a growth. It, it's relatively benign. It's like a, an inter internal wart that expands locally, and it's not like a cancer that will spread throughout the body, but it will grow locally, and this is a very uh, difficult area of, your, of, the, of the body. I think you need to use terms that the patient can understand. It's a bit like a, uh, a switchboard or a fuse box. There's lots of important nerves coming through here. The um, optic nerve, maxillary nerve, and explain that to the patient that these structures would be at risk. Um, <clears throat> And you probably, given the amount of involvement of erosion of the uh, um, area of the cavernous sinus, you'd want some team involvement, certainly get the opinion of a neurosurgeon before actually going in there. You don't, you don't really know with these until you get in there what it's going to be like. If you're lucky, it'll come out easily and you, you can shell it out. Mm. But if, it's, if there's an extension going um, into the middle fossa, you want to have 
uh, have your neurosurgeon ready, at least so they can come and look at it. Mm. Anybody, any, any comments well, to that? Uh, I had one case similar to this one many years ago. And what, what I did was try to take the most of the papilloma out you can, but if, if there's still a, st a small amount, very close to the carotid artery or something that you're afraid, um, I think you should leave it there. And in my case, I did that. I did an MRI. There was very little bit that I, it looked like inverted papilloma. And then six months afterwards, and we did MRI for five years, it, it, it disappeared for, for our luck and our patient's luck, of course. Yeah. But I, I prefer not to do like a, a cancer surgery on this kind of patient. You know, take the most out, but if you're in doubt, just leave a little bit if, if so it's dangerous. So you're going to do a, a, a wide sphenoidotomy? Yes, and in then, this case, yes. And, and debulk as much as you, you can. Yes. Maybe use some angled instruments, but if you can't necessarily get all that lateral bit out, you might just leave that and rescan it. Yes, because probably some of, the, some of it is attached to this part okay. where there's de this defect, yep. and this is the place that it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So this is where I'm going to take a lot of care because, yep. you know, there's the carotid artery just beside it. And if you're in doubt, I prefer to leave it and see okay. if, if necessary, make another surgery. Joe, any? Uh, no, I, I agree with Paul. I think you need to do a very wide sphenodotomy and probably a pterygopalatine um, approach as well to try and get as clear it all as safely as or as much as you can as safely as possible um, as Richard said if there's a little bit that's really stuck down onto the carotid or onto the cavernous sinus this isn't cancer so you, you can leave it and, and monitor it yeah. but ideally you're going to clear as much out as you can okay Christos, anything? Yeah, the same, essentially the same. Why the sphenoidotomy? Using both nostrils. I would like to use both nostrils, so take out the posterior septum, yeah. so work with, uh, from both sides. Uh, Transpterygoid, also to get some more access, drill out the pterygoid route to get more access laterally. And what I would like to see is the axial scans, because in the axial you can see better, I think, the involvement of the cavernous or the carotid. And in a couple of cases I had like this, um, it helped to do an MRA before the surgery, just to look at the, um, and I spoke with the neuroradiologist. To yeah. the, just to discuss the degree of extension into the cavernous sinus. Yeah. And it's good to have a friend, a neurosurgeon. Or Any, friend anyway. yeah. Podrit, would you do anything? No, it's the same. The same? Because we cannot drill anything here yeah. just uh, as we proceed what? in the maxillary sinus. I think that, let's say, a subtotal resection, as they, yeah. my colleague said, and wait and see, looking at the patient carefully okay. once a year, maybe. Mm -hmm. say Ian? Yeah. I was gonna, um, <laughs> about 10 years ago, I reported a series which was the largest series of sphenoid inverted papillomas at the time, and that's only nine. And subsequent, we've had seven, and in all the cases, we've been able to do a complete removal. But these are some cases that are some of the scariest because you're basically peeling it off the carotid and optic. And of the 16 now, we've only had one recur in that. And Several of these are redo, redo mm. from, from mm. others with that. So we've had pretty good success trying to be completely remove it. But I agree, there, it, it really does get your coronaries going. OK. So essentially, in this fellow, the more you discuss it, the more you, um, you sort of uh, decide to change matters. So I initially thought, well, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll do this in the NT theater. And I looked at it again. I thought, no, I'll, I'll have a quick word of mine neuroradiology colleague, and, uh, and he said, oh, I'm not really very sure. And he had, a, he had the benefit of all the cuts there, and, and that inverting papilloma was on um, dehiscent carotid artery and dehiscent dura further anteriorly. Um, and so I th thought, right, okay, well, that's good that you know about that, because if I need your help, I'll be calling you. Um, and then I, I spoke to my neurosurgical colleague, and he said, well, why don't you come and do it in neurotheatres? And I said, that's a really good idea. I'll come and do it in neurotheatre. Um, but actually, the bit that was the, the, the real challenge was not, the, um, was not this, which actually peeled off pretty easily uh, off the dura. It was this. Yeah. And in fact, the disease was extending further down than it seems to show on the... Um, uh, on the, uh, the MR scan, the disease was tunneling all the way down, uh, way down here. So despite opening up through the pterygopalatine fossa and, and, and drilling that down, that was actually really difficult to access in the, um, 
in the in the in the base of the uh, the the, uh, the pterygoid plates. And I, the one thing that always, it's a bit like the frontal sinus, if you've got inverting papilloma in the sphenoid sinus, it always worries me um, because it's arising in an abnormal area. And we do know from the literature that they are more likely to have dysplasia or uh, risk of, uh, of squamous carcinoma. So we drilled all of that out, but that's the area I'm going to be watching really carefully on repeat imaging. So how long do we, final question, how long do we, uh, do we follow up uh, inverting papilloma for? Ian? Um, I typically look at them Q6 months for the first two years, Q yearly up to five or six years, and then most people get tired of me by that time. <laughs> okay. Anybody any different? Yeah, I, I, you go. Uh, just for three years, uh, three years free of disease, three, three years free of endoscopic disease. If you, if you can image, uh, image it well in clinic, okay. uh, that was Nick Jones's rule of thumb, and I intend just to follow that. Okay. And uh, I suppose one last supplementary question. If your IP shows evidence of dysplasia, do you take it to your tumour board? Or do you just watch it yourself? Yes, I'd take it to the tumour board because they, they can convert to carcinoma in situ. Yeah. yeah. Okay, everybody, everybody seems to be nodding there. So I think on that... Uh, uh, on that note, uh, I'll, uh, I'll end the session uh, unless there are any, I'll take one or two questions. Any questions from the audience? If that's not the case, then what I'll do is I'll uh, just invite you to thank the uh, panellists who I think have been fantastic uh, in the usual manner. <laughs>